This is sand day on the Orkney Islands and I'm standing on the Ness of Brock. Ness meaning a headland and Brock being the ancient Norse word for a fort. This was the perfect stopping off point for the Vikings coming from Norway over there on their way to raid the rich abbeys of northern England 300 miles in that direction. There's loads of Viking remains on this island and some local school kids have written in to us because they think that these mounds might be Viking too. Well, we've got just three days to find out. Shona, it's the middle of June and it's absolutely freezing. I know. <laughs> is it always like this up here? No, it's normally quite nice, but today's a bit different. Is it going to stay like this or is it going to get better? Oh, it gets better, doesn't it? <laughs> so these are the styes of Brock, is that right? Yeah, the mound. Go and stand on that mound there, Shona, in the middle yeah. there. And then we've got people on, on all of them. You can see, it's not very good in this light, but you can see this is number one here that Shona's standing on now. Yeah. And you can see the low mound. Uh, just showing up in the grass like that and then fills on two over there and you can see that it's against the uh, skyline it shows up quite nicely as yeah. a mound and then three is that sort of donut shape rather flat uh, mound over there with the geophysics side and you can see that shows up against the sea over in that direction and then four is that huge rather spread mound over there with Jenny with the yellow coat on the top uh, and uh, you, again you can see that against the, the landscape at the back so these four mounds up on the top of this lump. And why do we think they're Viking? Well, <clears throat> just over a hundred years ago, the, the farmer from West Brook, Trail Denison, found uh, a rusty old sword and an axe and something that was described as a cauldron. And people think that possibly he dug them up from the styes here. Right. And that's what we're hoping you'll find out. But Mick, presumably just because there were Viking things found here, it doesn't necessarily mean that the site was originally Viking. No, no, I mean, there could be all, all sorts of things. I mean, these could be barrows, it could be Bronze Age, you know, 2000 BC, something like that, or Cairns. But then they could have been taken over by the Vikings. Absolutely, because sites get reused time and time again, so the Vikings would be, what, 800, 1000 AD. You know, it's all a bit of a conundrum at the moment. So I mustn't make the mistake of thinking just because we found something Viking, what no. we're going to get no. is, is going to be Viking. We're getting through to you, aren't we? It's <laughs> never what we think it's going to be. <laughs> so whatever it is, it won't be what we thought. Right. <laughs> We shouldn't have to wait long before we get the first geophysics information about the mounds, but already one thing's clear, we're going to have to be careful where we walk. Got some great aerial photos. Those are absolutely wonderful. That's, that's mound one there. Um, that's mound two. Mound three is the sort of donut shaped one with yeah. a dip in the middle. Mound four up the top there, that, that really big one, that uh, it, it looks very messy on the ground, mm -hmm. but that really does look like some really quite big structure yeah. or something. That's fantastic. And all the medieval ploughing across there shows up really, really clearly. But it appears to be largely sterile, for want of a better word. There's not evidence that suggests it's settlement. So it's yeah. fairly quiet from looks your point of view. quiet from the magnetic yeah. point of view. Yeah. Well, this one but doesn't look quiet at all. <laughs> <It is. laughs> I mean, it's just wild. And where is Mound 4 in here? Well, well Mound 4 is actually in that sort of area. Just so, so the noisiest bit is actually outside beyond. the mound. Mm. But this is often the case. You'll get midden deposits, the rub rubbish deposits, outside of where people are living. These are typical of the responses we get from settlement. Mm. Uh, if I didn't know better, I'd have said it was a brock. And what's a brock? Oh. It's a fortified tower from really the Iron Age, isn't it? Yes, sort of, from sort of before period. the time of Christ and for quite a long time afterwards, about around the time of Christ. And these were very elaborate stone-built structures, uh, often thought to be used for defence, but they also attracted uh, the local community. So there's a village that very often grows up around the brock. Uh, subsequent to it. So that's what this could be around here is all the village remains in fact. But you've been talking Brocks and you've been talking yeah. Iron Age. Does that mean that you're all assuming from the beginning that these aren't originally Viking sites? Um, 
we don't know for sure where the Viking artefacts came from from this site. Um, looking at the survey, because I've just set foot on this site for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> looking at the survey, I did wonder whether that, the one that's producing the, the sterile results, as John calls them, was a robbed out Viking grave. And that's still a possibility, I think. Well, if we're going to have enough time to find out, it's important to start digging now. And the decision made is that we start a trench here on the less complicated Mound 3 while we wait for more geophysics information on the bigger mound. If we do have the remains of an Iron Age brock on Mound 4, then we're talking about a tower which once looked like this. And what do we think they would have been used for? Well, they've got galleries and staircases in the walls. They may have had floors, so it's, we're thinking of something like a fortified tower, almost like a castle. And what sort of period is this? Well, it, it's, it's probably better to think of them as Iron Age, you know, the few centuries BC going on into the few centuries AD. They belong to really the Picts, the, 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 the native sort of people in Scotland. And were the Picts still here when the Vikings arrived in the yeah, 9th century? Yeah, they, they go order. right through because we don't have the interruption up here of the, of, of the Roman occupation. So prehistory carries on if you want to think of it like that. But what about this idea that the Vikings came along in the 9th century and reused the mounds to bury their dead? The only evidence for this is the Viking finds, but can we be sure that they were found on the Ness of Brock? Carinza, I'm getting mixed signals about these Viking finds. Some oh, yeah. people are saying to me there were Viking finds on the Ness, and other people are saying there may have been Viking finds associated with the Ness. What, what's it, the story? it is a bit confusing. I mean, the, the only evidence we have um, for, for the finds is from an antiquarian called Walter Trail Dennison. He had a list of everything he'd found around here, or been given, that came from around here. And he lists two Viking finds from this area. Um, the most significant, I think, the definite one, is a skull found buried on top of a mound called Styes, and that's the Styes of Brock out there. That skull was found with a Viking sword, which is now in the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. So we can be confident there was a Viking burial on a mound out on the Styes on the Ness up there. So we've definitely got something Viking there. And who was he? He was the farmer who lived here. That's his picture over there. Uh, he lived and farmed here from about 1850 to his death in 1894. And as well as being a very keen amateur archaeologist, he was also a folklorist and gathered a lot of stories from around here. And this was his actual house. And, and in fact, this is his study, I think. And if it was from sitting here, if you come and have a look, he could have actually seen out of his window, right across onto the Ness. Um, that's our site up there. You can see all our diggers on the horizon there. But unfortunately, he just describes them. We don't have a plan or anything saying exactly where any of this came from. We know we had a Viking grave on the Ness that came from a mound, but we don't know which mound it is. And it now seems windier than ever up here on the Ness, and there's nowhere to hide. Even my favourite place of shelter has blown over. But we are making progress with Mound 3. We've got our first find. This is a prehistoric pot lid. Apparently, you can see how it's been worked there and there and there and around there. And so far, our dig here seems to be confirming that this mound is indeed a cairn, which means it's a huge pile of stones built in the Bronze Age to cover a burial, usually a cremation. In addition to the four mounds here, we've also decided to investigate what may be another cairn at the other end of the Ness. This is a job that needs doing because it's starting to be washed away by the sea. And any information we can get will help us understand how this headland was used in the past. Carenza, meanwhile, has found another excuse to stay indoors. It was in the house when we came here. Oh, really? Well, here's the Nesselbrach now. You'll see the Stays of Brach market. Oh, the Stays of Brach, yes, I see. And it says site of Pict's house there. That's yes. interesting. I mean, that must be referring to that Mound 4, the big one, mustn't it? Well, there's not many maps you find pixels written on, I don't think. No, I mean, it's, um, it doesn't, of course, mean that it is a Pictish structure, but it's interesting that someone's thought it's that interesting, a building, rather that there's no yeah. mention of any burial mounds or anything there, is there? Yes, this map is 1905. Oh, yes. But see, yes. that map could be much older because it's on traceable cloth. Ah, yes, the Koenor tracing cloth. I so this see. map could, so be, it's... could be much older than that. Stuart, can you show them what you were showing me just before lunch? 
Uh, yeah, I was, we can see I'm what's... trying to look at the, all the lumps and bumps on the headland as a whole, not just yeah. focusing in on the mound. And what's happening at this end, where the, the large uh, Mount 4 is behind us, is a whole series of little paddocks and fields and enclosures going down towards the, 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 the water over there. And they seem to sit on top of a larger circular feature. And it's starting to look like there's something imposed on top of a, a brock, is what it looks like to me at the moment. But quite what interesting. Sort of, what sort of width across is that? It's about 30 metres. Mm. 30 metres? Mm. Mm. That's, that's the full that's area. Full there. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But what was really interesting is this particular feature, which is coming out here, which has got these bowed sides. Yeah. And it's very distinctive, and it's over ploughed. I'll show you, it's over here, because yeah, it stands out so quite well. well. The earthwork Stuart's talking about is much easier to see on this aerial photo. And I'm wondering whether it's something... Maybe it's a hell of a width, actually. Go on, tell them what you see. told me you thought it might be. I'm, hell of width. I'm just wondering whether it, whether it seemed like a, a, a great hall, a big hall. Yeah. Of, a, of a North period satellite. Isn't it too which wide? Is it it's too big, wide. is it? It's ever so wide. How, yeah. how long is it? It's, a, it's about 17, 18 metres in length right. well, by about nine, ten. Long. But wide. it's very wide. Yeah. It's without parallel up here. Mm. You say you think that this is probably too big for yes. a, a Norse house. I look forward to being proved wrong. Well, hopefully, the latest geophysics results will help us sort out the complicated lumps and bumps of Mound 4. John? Okay, Have you got the results? <laughs> you don't waste much time, do you? Are they any good? And keeping the Where to Dig committee down to just a few people should mean we reach a quicker decision. We've done the 40 metre block right over the mound. We're getting a clear high resistance response in the middle. I mean, that's what we may assume to be the brock. And that means stone. That's the black areas. That's the black areas. Yeah. Do you reckon that's a brock? It's about the right size for it. I mean, it's very, well, it's not getting clear wall lines, but that's what you'd expect with the amount of rubble that you, you'd have associated with the Brock structure. Yeah. So where do you think we should dig? Well, there's no way we can cope with that, is it? I don't think so. I, the Brock's I, a big, complicated structure, isn't it? It is, and even just taking the top off, all you're going to find is rubble, and yeah. there'd be an awful lot of work to try and get the wall lines. I mean, How long be... would it take to excavate a Brock? Well, at the moment, um, uh, we've got a research project that's working in Shetland looking at a Brock site, and we've been working at it for two years. We're going back there for the <laughs> third year, and we right. haven't got... The so we're not going to solve this in three days, no, are we? No, so what can point. we do in well, our three well, I days? I think that's the point. We've got to... I mean, our job is to look at these mounds and to say what they are, what date they are, and so on. Uh, and we may not be able to answer that this is a brock, but if we look at the midden material or the ditch or whatever around it... Or uh, wall lines on the or wall lines at it, yeah. we, we, may, we may be able to say something about the, the date of it. That's right. The, I mean, one, thing, one mm, possibility might be to put target. it somewhere in this area, yeah. which would then take in Stuart's enclosure, so we can have a look at that. Because of limited time, the decision is to start a small trench here on the edge of Mound 4 with the aim of finding some dating evidence for the brock. Depending how it goes, we can extend the trench to investigate Stuart's idea of a Norse hall if we have time. Well, that's looking really good, isn't it, Phil? I mean, it, it, it's changing all the time, mate. You can yeah. see that we've got a beautiful curve, a beautiful yeah. sweeping round now with these big curbing stones. Yeah. So we're talking about a cairn here, some sort of burial mound, are we? I don't think there's any question about that. There's I no mean, domestic activity, the geophysics, no, the geophysics didn't show any yeah. debris, did no. it? So um, and I mean, we've got no finds ourselves. We've got a few of these little pot lid things, yeah. these round stone features. So it's a funerary monument of some sort. I'm sure it's got to be. So, more work to do cleaning up and recording here. But from what we've seen so far, this cairn shows no signs of having been reused for a Viking burial. In fact, the evidence found today has very much been the story of how this headland was used in prehistoric times. And can we now add to the picture and include another cairn at this end of the ness? So what's the verdict, Mick? It's a cairn. Uh, you can see we've laid the, the stones and the tapes out so that you can see that uh, roughly the outline, a part of it's gone over the cliff. So it's... what date is it? Well, it looks exactly like a Bronze Age cairn. It's like a lot of Bronze Age cairns we've seen before, um, but there's one slight problem. Yeah. <laughs> Which is? This. Oh, oh wow, lovely. yeah. <laughs> That's uh, one of these stone right. bowls or whatever made of soapstone. Soapstone. It's or steatite, it's called, isn't it? And yeah. it's Norse. <laughs> so it's, it's Viking.
the Vikings didn't use pottery very much and the, most of their vessels were made from this very soft stone that you can carve with, with metal. Normally when you find these vessels, they're chiseled, quite roughly chiseled out in the middle. Yeah. This one's actually quite smooth. It's got, on the edge here, it's got a rivet hole where it's been oh, broken right. and mended. Oh, right. You yeah. can still see yeah. the iron staining on the inside from, yeah. the, from the rivet. So it was valuable enough to repair it at some stage. Oh, yeah. and it's, yeah, uh, yeah. It's how, how, how big is this thing going to be? Big, quite big. Like that? Yeah. 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 Sort of, yeah. You're going like that? Sort yes. Of. yes, like that. And yeah. shallow? Well, could be, could be quite could be deep. Quite deep. Could be quite, quite deep. deep. You yeah. can actually see. Cooking. Yeah, you can see there are very deliberate lines crossing this, and that's not mm. usually what you get if you're just scouring out the bowl for cleaning it. And that looks more like a pattern. So, really what do you think that pattern could be? Well, it, it could be a gaming board. It's just possible oh, right. that yeah. um, you know, once the, the final use of the steer type was was to use the inside of it as a board for playing Nefertafel, the Viking, well-known mm. Viking game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if this is Viking, why do we think that the cairn is Bronze Age? Well, everything about the cairn is Bronze Age. This is actually found in the stones right at the top. So it, why it's, what it's doing there, how it got there, we really don't know. So it could be a Bronze Age cairn and then with some kind centuries of later, it was just dropped That's right. in the Viking yeah. group. Now we know what it is, what are we going to do? I don't think we're going to do any more, uh, no. are we? Because it, it would take a long time to either pick that to pieces or indeed to excavate any more. So we're happy with this one. Mm. We've got to move on to the others. Well, end of day one, we're going back to uh, our hotel for a game of Nefertatl. <laughs> uh, we've got lots more to find out yeah. over the next two days and lots of clues. See you after the break. It's nine o'clock on day two. It's as windy as ever, though it is warmer than it was yesterday. And last night, after we'd finished, John from Geophysics came up with some amazing results from Mound 2. It might not look much there, but if you look at the magnetometry of Mound 2, you see this big thing shooting up there. And according to John, that's a ferrous spike. In other words, there's a piece of metal there. And who knows, that could be where the Viking was buried. But the big question is, even if there are Viking remains of some kind there, have we got enough time to explore it thoroughly? Normally, where you've had burning in the bottom of the kelp pit, you get a strong magnetic response on not getting it from here. So could it so be a hole where somebody's plundered this <laughs> already? <laughs> it doesn't look like that either, because you have got stone lining, yeah. so we're not it sure, looks to deliberate. be honest. But if I mean if we could if we could encompass something like this feature here, maybe the the kist which if we find that it's not been disturbed and we leave it, mm. plus we can encompass the spikes as well. If yes. we can get a, a trench that's going to cover all those eventualities, I think that's going to maximise the result. Well, I'm keen to get started, but clearly this is an important decision for the archaeologists. We can't just dig for Viking treasure like Trail Denison would have done. Our trench has to be positioned to give us the most information without damaging the mound any more than we have to. But now everyone's been consulted, digging can begin on mound too. team has got a lot of ground to cover, but they're aiming to give us a complete picture of the four mounds and the area in between. This is the progress they've made so far. While at Mound 4, the news is that we're beginning to find bits of pottery. Can you pass it up? It's blackened on one side, isn't it? Yeah. Prehistoric? It's definitely prehistoric. It looks as if it could be Iron Age. Mm -hmm. That would go nicely with the broth, wouldn't it? That would go very nicely with the, the broth. Well, it's early days yet, and we're still very much in the topsoil. But Stuart's still pushing for this trench to be extended, so we can find out if this earthwork ridge belongs to the Iron Age broch, or possibly a Norse hall. Of course, it's possible that the Vikings never actually lived on the Ness, but kept it as a special place for burials. 
If that was the case, then this huge mound next to the present-day farm is likely to be the site of their settlement. What actually is it? <laughs> I know it's a big mound next it's, to the farm. It's but... a big mound of rubbish and buildings, stone buildings, and all the rubbish from the from the buyers, from the farms over thousands of years, and all the, the domestic rubbish well, as well. Well, so manure and, and ash and from fires from and food, and, yeah, food yeah, remains and all the rest and of it. And fallen down buildings. And so it, it's really what we'd call a midden then, is it? Yeah. Which is, yeah, a, I think, a northern effect, word anyway, a, isn't it? Yeah, a rubbish dump or a, rubbish dump, yeah. or a, or a yeah. dung heap. Yeah, it's a lot bigger area when you get up here, isn't it? It's certainly mm. big enough to put a, a farm on, I would have thought. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you can see as well the height above the surrounding landscape. Yeah. And all the rubbish still building up on it. Well, that's <laughs> right. That's mound formation in action. That's exactly how this thing formed in the first place. Outside Scandinavia, farm mounds are only found here on Sandy and neighbouring island North Rondelsay. And just a mile or so across the island, a local farmer has found a fragment of what might be a Viking comb in a farm mound which has been eroded away by the sea. Well, it actually came from here, oh. along us <laughs> shales here. Literally just there? Just right in yeah. the area. It was, it, was, it was just sticking out like that shale there. And I just disturbed the air for around and it just fell in the head. There it is, in the box. Mm. Oh, good. Right. Isn't that beautiful? That's absolutely beautiful. It's an absolutely beautiful comb, it really is. I wish I'd found it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. It's rather, rather pretty. What, what sort of date do you think that, Holly? We call it a late north comb. It's probably from about the 12th or 13th century, maybe the 13th century. It'll be made out of antler, and you can see the remains of the bronze rivets. That little plate would have uh, held the, the two sides oh, together and been riveted around. with, yes. uh, with you can bronze. You see the green where it's exactly. uh, de yes. And when you say it's Norse, it, it's not from the sort of early Viking period, the pagan period, it's from much later when they no. were Christianised and settled here. Exactly. What's so right. nice, it's even got coarse teeth on one side and fine yes. teeth on the other, and you get yes. combs, that's how you have combs today. There seems it? to be small carvings on each. That's right. Each of that. It's very that's delicate. That's right, it is. It's called a ring and dot ornament. It's oh, very yeah. common yes. on, uh, well, all objects of Viking and late Norse often, especially bone, obviously, they often have... Uh, um, ring and dot ornament. Yeah. The sea has effectively cut a section through the farm mound, allowing us to see the layers of rubbish deposited over the centuries. Of course, erosion's a very serious problem around the whole coast of Orkney. Yes. And you only need one very bad storm from the wrong direction and you can use, lose metres lose of land. Lose the whole thing and you can lose yeah. all the interest that was in it as yeah. well, can go with it. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. This 13th century Norse comb is easy enough to reconstruct on the computer, but how difficult were bone combs to make? To find out, Ollie has suggested we attempt to make a replica of this earlier 9th century comb, which is the type often found in pagan Viking graves like the one we're hoping to find on the Ness. Keith Prosser, a Viking enthusiast, has agreed to take up the challenge. Um, what what animal is this from? This is a red deer a red antler. Deer. Right. Um, and out of this, you have to choose the, the, the best sections you can possibly get to, to actually make, uh, make up the bone comb, which comes in various composite pieces. They look horribly complicated. I mean, looking at all those tiny teeth, to, I mean, it's easy enough to break them when you're combing in your hair, let alone trying to make them. How long do you think it's going to take? Well, I think if I can get to the stage where I'm cutting the teeth, I'll be really pleased, because oh, that's God. the easiest part, as <laughs> oh, far no, as I'm it? concerned, yeah. Actually, cutting all the pieces from here is the hardest part. And uh, probably maybe five to six hours, if I'm lucky. <laughs> Keith's first challenge is to cut and shape flat pieces of bone from the twisted antler. Can I have a go? Yeah, that, by all means, this yeah. size is more rounded size, so this might be a bit tougher, actually. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so just cross like that? Yeah, that's fine, yeah, it's just nice and flat. It's quite hard, isn't it? It's not. It's a very tough material, impossible. the antler, yeah. yeah. I think I ought to start an apprenticeship, really, now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, out on the Ness. On Mount 2, everyone's doing their bit to help. And the focus of interest is the so-called kelp pit. Do you reckon this could be the burial that, that, that they found? So we have to look for if there's shell in the bottom. Yeah, if there's, there, if there's If there's residue of shell, because um, kelp is burning seaweed, and the, and the shell is left in the bottom, usually in quite thick layer. Well, we're not going to know burning. talking about it, are we? No, <laughs> no, it's video. It's right. clean. What you're looking for is, is a layer of ash, burnt shell, 
I don't and it's, it's quite often quite white because it's all the yeah. it's all the little barnacles dropping off the stuff and lands in the bottom. No. I don't think we should miss anything of that. Sort of yeah, yeah. We, we haven't we haven't got into it at all yet, really, have we? It may look lovely and sunny, but let me assure you, it's freezing and the wind is as strong as ever. Ollie, why did the Vikings sail all that way across inhospitable seas simply in order to land at this windswept place? This windswept place. <laughs> This is a beautiful place. This is magic. You have to remember where they'd come from. They'd come from Norway, and although that's staggeringly beautiful as well, it's a very difficult place to live. People were farming along the edges of fjords on tiny, narrow strips of land. They were eking out living, and the population was increasing. And of course, you remember the Viking ships. They had the technology to travel. And I think when they came to Orkney, they didn't see a windswept island at all. They saw paradise, where they could live and farm and settle and grow crops and raise cows and sheep. And so they pigs. were farmers as much as they were raiders? Oh, yes, absolutely, especially here. I mean, these Orkney islands, there's no trace from the archaeological record of battles and destruction or of um, you know the Vikings having wiped out the local population that was here it seems as if there was a maybe the local population had been in decline but it seems as if there was a sort of gentle integration between the Pictish period and the Viking period and what do we know about how they buried their dead here they buried them in pits in the ground the pits could be oval they could be rectangular they could be boat shaped or they could be actual boats and most of them, when they were buried on uh, new territory, uh, territory that hadn't had older monuments on it, were flat graves. They weren't covered by mounds. Back at the farm, although Keith's making progress, cutting the antler bones taking longer than expected, and probably means we'll have to wait until tomorrow to see the finished result. The basic ingredients of the bone comb have been made now. Uh, we've got most of the plates that should be needed for constructing the comb and the two connecting back pieces which will cement them all together, sandwich them together. This is the trench we're pinning our hopes on. How far have we got? Well, it's, it's coming along very, very nicely, actually, Tony. There's, there's the, uh, the feature there that we were deliberating whether or not it was a kelp pit, and there's still no evidence of burning. And so we're, we're still hopeful um, that it may well be the site of a burial. We've got it excavated down to the, the top of the archaeology. It's planned and we're ready to go on in through the base of it now. So, Phil, yesterday we had this as the, uh, with the, the site with the big ferrous spike. Have we found what that is or are we still chasing it? Well, no, no, that, the, the ferrous spike is in the hole at the back. Have we found what that is? Uh, John's found what it is. Well, in fact, <laughs> I found what it was, but John told me that that was it. <laughs> Go on, tell him, John. I think, I think I'll go home. No, 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 no. <laughs> I want to see you grovel. Now, <laughs> would you like to see a Viking sword? Yeah. Or yeah, would you like to... to see what caused the response? Yeah, yeah. What's this rock, rock with iron in it, is it? No, it's a burnt stone. Ah, right. Yeah. And yeah. It on it. The response you got was enormous. I know, and if you hold this next to the magnetometer, it just goes off scale. Good Lord. Over 200 now. And I take it away, it drops. Why does it do it's, that? It's because it's, it's been heavily fired and it becomes very magnetic as it cools down. But well, that spike was enormous. Yeah, yeah. and it, well, you can see it goes off the scale. It There's was... two or three large stones exactly at that point. And the other blips I was getting throughout the mound, there's just smaller fragments of burnt stone scattered over this mound. So we don't think there's anything metal there at all? So it's no, it'd appear not. <laughs> According to Phil, there's no evidence of burning in situ, so it seems likely that the stone was burnt elsewhere before it was built into the cairn. But now, time to get out of this wind and take refuge in one of the two bars on the island. And Tom Muir has just the remedy for anyone still feeling the cold. It's a traditional Orcadian drink known as cog. <laughs> Can I have a bit of hush for a minute, please? Uh, before we all get completely wasted on this cog, can we see uh, if we can agree 
uh, as to where we've got to in discovering what's under all four mounds. Steve, number three, the donut mound. Are you pretty sure you know what you've got now? Uh, I think it's a cat. The, the walling that we've got continues round and there's a lot of stone inside it, some slippage outside, but it looks very cairn like, probably a Bronze Age date. Right, so it's a cairn. What it's about a cairn. number four, Mick? The, the one that we were saying earlier on is, was a brock. It might still... be a brock or whatever, yeah. Well, we've got a small hole there which is producing lots of nice pottery, which we think is probably Iron Age, and it's also producing lots of flint. So it's probably produced more than the other holes put together, I think. <laughs> But uh, we don't think we'll extend it. We think, we think we're happy with what we've got. We're just going to record it and take it to pieces. But the reason we were going to extend it was to try and solve the question of what those bowed wall-like looking yeah. structures were that Stuart found. Well, we may be able to do that without extending it because it is a complicated hole. So we'll have to spend some time on it tomorrow unravelling it. What about the one where we had John's ferrous spike that just turned out to be a, a stone. Well, that's, we're early days on that, really. We've only taken off the topsoil and cleared off some of the superficial rubble. But what we do know is that what we thought might be a kelp pit definitely isn't. And that's interesting in itself, because, of course, we do have an unexplained feature still left there to investigate. What about number one? We've done nothing there except... Were you geophysing it this afternoon? Yes, but I'm saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but tomorrow... I'll tell you everything. Yeah. <laughs> so there's plenty to do tomorrow. Oh, bags of things. Yeah. Well, I think we need to stay here three weeks, actually. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Let's see how we feel tomorrow uh, after the cog, after shall the we? Cog, right. uh, <laughs> shall I just say, bring in the, the cog! cog. <laughs> Day three, and thankfully the cold wind seems to have stopped at last. At Mount Four, Stuart will be pleased to see that at last we're extending this trench to find out if this ridge of high ground belongs to an Iron Age brock or a later Norse hall. On Mount Two, Phil's got the job of investigating the so-called kelp pit. Could it be the Viking burial we're looking for? Several of the archaeologists are beginning to think so, partly because of a piece of bone which was found in this trench late last night. Right. It's in bad condition, but it's the, it's the texture on the inside that interests yeah. me strangely. Indeed, it, it actually looks more human than animal, yes. doesn't it? Mm. It does. Yeah. yeah. Basically, the weight of it is mm. very light, and this texture on the inside is very human, these small little mm. kind of perforations yeah. that you can yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe a small chunk of human bone. <laughs> <laughs> so could we have found our Viking burial? Phil can hardly believe it. And you're adamant it's not a kelp pit. I'm, I'm sure it's not a kelp pit. Well, I mean, it, re <laughs> it really does do my heart good to sort of hear you being so absolutely adamant about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it makes us pleased, and it's certainly going to make a lot of school kids happy, isn't it, eh? <laughs> it's certainly a fantastic start to our final day, but how are we doing with the Viking comb? Mr Towery has offered to lend a hand. The stage we're at now, we've got to finish off the backs by decorating them, um, then they'll be ready to be drilled and riveted through. Straight over with a bash at that. Yep. Well, we've got the diagram of the scar comb here with some of the decoration on it. We're going to try and put these nice parallel lines around the back of the comb, get these crossbars and the little dot and ring decoration through yeah. the centre. <laughs> Mr 
Meanwhile, back on Mound 2, Ollie's theory is that what we found is a boat-shaped Viking grave. Yeah. This could be the hole that Trail Dennis and Doug. Ah, right. 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 So this is where the. Uh, and that's why yeah. you've got this strange pit, this very irregular pit, partly stone line, because the part stone lining at this end, which is yeah. the, the end of a boat, if you like, yeah. is what. Trail About where Dennison I'm sitting, where the prow into. was then. Exactly. Am I well, it, either the prow or the stern. We're yeah. not sure which yeah. end is which. But yes, he could Wowee. have found himself in the end of a boat-shaped stone setting. Yeah. The thing was, the burial was supposed to have broken up because the bones were poor, yes. weren't they? Well, so the other thing that we've been saying this morning is that, of course, the Victorians weren't that bothered about the bones. No. They were interested in the, the things yep. and they yeah. would have taken the skull. Yeah. It's a sort yeah. of curio, even. So it's not surprising that bits of bone would find themselves in the upcast from the hole that he dug. I must say, yesterday, all you academics laughed when I said <laughs> it looks like it could be robbed out to me. <laughs> oh, dummy, you don't know much, do you? <laughs> well, you've had the last laugh on us, haven't you, so far? <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Phil's job now is to clear out the stones that aren't part of the actual boat-shaped grave. The only mound that we haven't looked at so far is Mound 1, and we've now started a small trench there. Hi, Tom. Hi. How are you getting on? All oh, fine. Fine. Just what, have we just seen if it's cane or cane material? Yeah, it's very much like cane material, really. Yeah. Um, a couple of bits of burnt stone near the top, right. not very big, um, which might have been given the reading. Yeah. Not really much sign of burnt stone down here, yeah. but um, of course it could be more underneath the rubble. It's just a bit of a so no, no finds to help us really? Well, this just turned up uh, literally oh, a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> and we haven't had time to do anything with it yet. Uh, now Ollie will have a look at that. It's, it looks like a... Uh, it looks like a nail head. Yeah, I know. Doesn't it? I know, <laughs> Off a but... a big uh, nail, right? Well, that's not going to be Bronze Age then, is it? Well, no, but it might be Viking ship. <laughs> it's it's similar to um, rivet heads yeah. that you get on, on the, you know, the cranker built yeah. Viking boats, the small boats that used to wow. fly in mountains. <laughs> I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying that it, it's similar to, uh, to one that came up for you around the coast at yeah. Scar. Once again, this was found in the top soil, so it could have been just dropped there. But nevertheless, geophysics are pleased to hear about it. Uh, an iron something. Real iron this time. Like yes. Yes. Real iron, yes. <laughs> well, it came from about there. Well, you do know this is a geophysics blip. No. Really? Is that, would that give that signal? I'd get a small signal from that. But we, we've got some burnt stone here as well. Yes, <laughs> yes. What was the geophys <laughs> like for this mound? Relatively quiet very similar to the other cairn. Right. Um, we'd got one or two anomalies, and we've put the trench to actually look at one of the anomalies yeah. and to get a picture of whether it is just a cairn. Yeah. I consider that a victory. <laughs> so do I, John. Yeah. <laughs> we just want a row of them now, John. In a line. Well, I'm afraid there isn't In a, a row. In a boat shape. <laughs> Lots of visitors on site today, and they all seem to be heading for Stewart's Trench on Mount Four, where there's a race against time to reveal the foundations of the bowed wall. At the moment, we're getting little bits of pottery and flint again, like we've got outside there. Is it what still sort all of day? Iron age? It's still all looking Iron Age, yeah, that's the, that's the opinion on it. Um, I mean, that's good at one level, isn't it? We've got all this Iron Age pottery, the suggestion this is a broth, that's all fitting quite nicely. It is, if we can get yeah. it to be a Viking hall as well, that's, that's all well and good. <laughs> but we lovely. can still feel pleased, even if it isn't. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Phil, you need to remember there might be a stone built partition across the boat shape setting because they like to build another chamber inside the boat. So it would be about halfway across, would it? Halfway well, long? Well, there's, there's no telling, to be honest, because in the scarred boat, it was about two-thirds of the way along the boat, but that was a real boat, and this is obviously not a real boat, no, it's right. a stone-built boat. So, I mean, you know, if, when you're cleaning the section, don't just assume that every stone is rubble or... No, stone. no, I... It might not... be a bit yeah, of a yeah. built structure. Yeah. Boat-shaped Viking graves can be five and a half to seven metres in length, which could mean that the other end of this boat would be somewhere near Phil's toolbox at the far end of the trench. From the air, you do get a fantastic view of this headland. And it's also much easier to appreciate the circular shape of the cairn on Mound 3, and, of course, the boat-shaped grave we're excavating on Mount 2. All right, so this is 
the uh, the one that we're getting the interesting boat shape out from. And you see they've laid the tape out around the outline of half the boat. Yes, I see so that. that. We've got the sort of uh, pointed end at each end, if you see what I mean. And again, that we're in the middle of a round mound. And if we had the time, we'd go off that to pick up the curve edge to it. How much higher would it have been than it is now? Well, if if that had the, the burial in it and then all the grave goods, they're going to put stones in over the top, which is what we can actually see at the other end of the shape there. They, that's probably the stone still in situ. And then, of course, they're going to build it up over the top of that. So it, it might have been another metre higher. How are you getting on? Oh, wow, it's nearly finished. Yep, last plate now. I'm just uh, doing the almost decorative cuts of the uh, teeth into... You look so fiddly. Aren't you terrified you're going to break one of the teeth? Well, so far, I haven't broken one, which is great, but I have gone very thin on some of them. <laughs> so um, it depends who's going to be the first one to try this as to, see if, to uh, uh, see if any can can cope with it well, or not. I'll go with that when you finish it. Well, I think we're OK with this one. Yeah, that's about the right height. So that's the last one. It should now be ready for use. Oh, isn't it beautiful? It, it feels so nice in the hand, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's sort of even the curve of the antler actually fits it really nicely. Yeah, well, I think that the, the test is in the combing. You really think I can I <laughs> really think so, yeah. All right, then. Let's have a go. Big question, is it pulling your hair out or is it actually working? No, it's, I'm not being a bit careful with right, it. That's fine, yeah. That seems to be OK. Yeah, no, it's actually pulling out the tangles as well. Stuart's survey of the wider landscape has given us an idea of what it would have looked like in the Viking period. This is where we started off. We've got the coastline, we've got the four four big mounds. Yeah. The mound at the north of the, the Nace of Brock here yeah. and the big farm mound. Yeah. And this is the coastline as we, we now see it. Yeah. If we could flip over, see, um, you get a very different picture because I think um, the coastline, as you can see, would have flooded all round here. And I think that the island, the nest, was an island, a tidal island, right, with a right. causeway going yeah, across yeah. to it. Can you see? Yeah. And yeah. that would have given it a much more defensible position for the brock and yeah. a much more important place yeah. for ritual, for burial. It also suggests that this is almost a sort of promontory where the, I mean, the farm mound is on one promontory, but the whole thing is a promontory sticking out into the sea, isn't that's, it? That's right, and that would have been put account also for the amount of build-up to, to help yep. it keep dry. Yep. Time's almost up, but have we managed to make sense of the complicated archaeology in the trench at Mound 4? <laughs> what do we think now, Stuart? Well, having dug it out, Tony, what we've got is a series of deposits over this side, which seems to be throwing up Iron Age pottery and um, structures over there. We've got something here which looks yeah. to be part of the same thing. Can you see either side? And then going over the top, we've got a structured wall, which is going off in that direction. And we know it's forming part of a bow-sided enclosure. Is it, is it a Viking hall? I don't know at the moment, because it's got nothing that specifically dates it, but it's the last thing that's on here, that's for sure. It, a lot of this is collapsed, isn't it? That's on right. either side of the wall. Yeah. Is, is that collapsed over? Your Iron Age stuff. It's, it appears to be, yeah. Yeah, we're not. Right, so and we're not getting any. We've got a lot of pottery and flints from out this side. Yeah. And we're getting very little from that side. So what's happening yeah. that side is very different to that side. Yeah. But it's whether it's vital. It's just a yeah. peephole, though. Well, yeah. in, in, in terms of structure, though, that wall is not Norse. Mm. It's, right. it's not Viking. It's not Norse. Yeah. Why do you say line. so definitely it's not Norse? What can you see that, that I can't? Norse walls are fairly broad. Uh, they tend to be faced on the uh, inside and the outside, large stones giving yeah. facings, a core of rubble or perhaps right. even turf. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't fit into the pattern that we have for the Northern Isles. Meanwhile, the ultimate test for the Viking style comb. Yeah. You haven't considered opening a salon, have you? <laughs> what do you think I should do? <laughs> <laughs> I think I might even have a. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I might even have a. Huh. <laughs> Am I allowed to tease it apart? <laughs> right, try it on your um, beard because. Um, Me beard? I haven't got a beard. Oh, you know, the sideburns. Well, I think they, oh, they oh the sideburns is definitely the. <laughs> oh, yes. They were for oh, beards and hair, apparently. I feel so a new man already. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> and there's actually nothing living in there either. Well, it was. It was. 
<laughs> they were used for delousing as well. So if you turn around, I'll just turn around the back of the Navy You'll never, the back. You'll never get it in the back. You'll never get it in the back. We'll get you tidied up for the uh, pub this evening. Oh, I'm glad of that. Cool. <laughs> Among the small army of islanders visiting the site today are, of course, Shona and Mr Thorne, who, along with everyone else, are keen to see what we've discovered this weekend. So what can we tell them? Well, we can now say that when the Vikings arrived on Sande in the early 9th century, they would have seen a headland dotted with Bronze Age burial cairns, probably more than we can see today, some having been lost through erosion, while others may have been ploughed away. We can also be pretty confident that the Vikings gave it the name the Ness of Broch because the ruins of an Iron Age Broch with a Pictish village round it were still very much a dominant part of this landscape. And Stuart's work looking at the floodplains around the Ness support the idea that the farm mound at West Brock was most likely the main focus of their settlement while they kept the Ness as a special place for the burial of their dead. And we found evidence of one of those Viking pagan burials this weekend. And this is how we think it might have looked. Now, it's rubbed out. Does that mean that we think that it's Denison's boat? I think we know that it was Denison who robbed it out as you say. I think we've actually, we now know where the skull and the sword that Denison found came from. They came from this point here. So I think probably for the first time ever on Time Team, we've actually <laughs> achieved our goal, which was to see whether there were any Viking burials under these mounds and indeed what was under all the other mounds. Yep. And I suppose what stuck in my mind most is that this little nose of land yeah. on the edge of this island has been used over and over again yeah. by different societies of human beings yeah. for how many years, Steve? About 4,000 years. Mm. And you're still farming it today? Yes. <laughs> you know what's really stuck in my mind is finally getting a comb through Phil's hair. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a first for time, Steve. <laughs> it's the first for Phil, too. <laughs>